I learned that there's three phases to a project. There's the vision, there's the plan, and then there's what gets built. And uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. And uh, Gretchen Snyder has a Bachelor of Science in Historic Preservation from Middle Tennessee State University and a Master of Urban and Regional Planning from Virginia Commonwealth University. She's worked, uh, she worked for four years as a curator of historic properties for the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities. She has 21 years of local government experience in land use administration and has spent 10 years with the city of Richmond, Virginia before moving to Sarasota in 2004. Uh, here, Gretchen has served as a general manager of planning and development for the city of Sarasota for the last eight years. And the planning and development division includes current planning, zoning, building and permitting, and code enforcement. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gretchen Snyder. part trying to figure out how you to got do it. this one you got it. all right thanks I'm gonna quickly just kind of talk a little bit about how um, uh, projects kind of get in the works because obviously a, uh, before we review a project or deal with anybody Move the microphone. All right. before we deal with anybody um, a lot has gone into all of the planning documents that we use as our guides so at first there's the long-range planning staff and our neighborhood planning staff get together with the community and from there we create comprehensive plans um, as well as a variety of other guiding plans that assist us in um, the development of the city so as mentioned before 1925 was really the first comprehensive plan that uh, the city of sarasota ever had uh, also in the 1970s there was a major rewrite of the zoning code as well as the um, city's comprehensive plan and that's when you started seeing the high rises along the Bayfront that came in. That's when um, a lot of the additional density in the downtown was approved. And in the suburbs, they actually reduced density. They created much larger lotting patterns, um, trying to keep it a little bit more in the suburban style. And then in the 2000s is when you start seeing the redevelopment of downtown. Andre Stwani was brought in, he did the um, new downtown master plan. We also did some uh, re-adoption of our Sarasota City Plan, and then we've had some other design um, studies being done, which as you can see from SEMCOM, which was the design workshop in 2010. Our, this is the future land use map, which is really difficult to see. You really have to blow it up because they're so, it's so detailed as what it is that we're expecting to see from a citywide standpoint um, for the future. So once we've got this comprehensive plan, that's when our zoning codes are created. And the zoning code is indeed the implementation of our vision that the community had said they wanted as part of that comprehensive plan. So we even have a zoning map from the 1920s, which that's a really early time frame to be having zoning. Um, so it was very cutting edge for the city to have gotten a zoning map um, from the 20s. And then that's our current downtown zoning map that you see today that everyone's pretty familiar with. And I will note that I may not agree with the boundaries of downtown because I do kind of think that we're missing out on Gillespie Park and the uh, uh, Park East neighborhood, which are all still part of downtown. While not necessarily downtown proper, they're still part of the downtown zone districts. And so once we have all of the zoning codes um, created and adopted, that's what our zoning staff and our planning staff uses to review um, development applications as well as when we meet with um, uh, potential developers who come into the city they want to know what our city's vision is and not only the vision but how the codes are in place in order to develop it so as a result of that you're you're seeing kind of the culmination of all of that in the Rosemary district here because there was one other thing that happened a few years ago was the downtown was kind of getting inundated with a lot of commercial development maybe a little bit too much but yet the Rosemary district couldn't seem to get any traction so there were some folks who went to the city commission and asked whether or not there could be an overlay um, put in the Rosemary District to make it a little bit more attractive to developers. And it has been incredibly successful. While we're still having um, a lot of development in the downtown proper, as evidenced by some of the um, uh, graphics that Norm showed you, we're really having a renaissance in the Rosemary Overlay District. Now there is a cap on the number of residential units that can go in there. There is also a sunset provision as um, a timing mechanism. It's five years from the date of um, adoption, 
we're not even close to the cap on the number of units that could go in there, but timing is probably gonna catch up before the actual number of units come in. But as you can see, you know, we've got Sarasota Flats, um, and eventually the Quay, which is number 12, we're still working with them right now, talking about doing a new development um, application for them. They're gonna keep the same numbers of residential units, commercial property, and office square footage that's in their existing development agreement, but they really wanna come up with a new concept plan that's much more urban in design, having a good block, breaking up of the blocks, more consistent with a, a downtown walkable community than what has currently been approved, which is more high-rise towers. That's not to say they may not have towers, but they're certainly trying to break up the blocks so you don't get that massive um, wall of buildings um, that you could get with having such a large, um, you know, it's 14 acres, so there's, there's the possibility of large um, stuff. Um, as we're looking to the future, we are currently, I think last year we did about 8,400 building permits in the building department with a construction value of $350 million. So needless to say, we're booming. Not all of that's in the downtown. A lot of it is rebuilds, you know, teardowns and rebuilds of single family homes throughout the city. But there have been obviously some very large construction projects. Um, we are still on track this year to probably meet or exceed that number of permits. Um, we still have some large projects coming in uh, that are hopefully or not so hopefully going to be constructed. But for the most part, it is a lot of rebuilds on single family homes, a lot of renovations. People are now able to um, come in and do renovations to the property that they may not have done. Um, I will note that I think there's been a lot of concern that this is bringing in a lot of residents to the city that may not otherwise have been here. And it was interesting in 2007, the city had 55,644 residents. Due to the downturn in the economy, that number decreased in 2010 to 51,917. So there was almost a 45, 4,600 person loss in residents. That's not just snowbirds, but actual residents of the city. As of 2013, which is the last year that we've got numbers, we are increasing in population. There is more coming back. So we're up in, as of 2013 at 52,584. So even though we're getting new buildings, we're getting new apartments, we are getting new residents, um, we're, we're still not where we were even in 07. So yes, it's increasing, but it's not gonna go gangbusters. Um, I had someone tell me an interesting fact that when they were doing the Van Wazel um, bond referendum, that the expectation for the city in like 1985, they were expecting our population to be around 80,000. So obviously, you know, that projection never occurred, um, but we still, you know, I understand people's concerns about that. Um, but as we go forward and look at uh, different things that are happening as far as what the future is gonna look like, um, we do have some efforts underway that's gonna impact not only what the uses are, but what the city is gonna look like. And one of those is the form-based code. Um, the city hired uh, some folks to come on board in August of 2013. Now the downtown already has a form-based code, so it shouldn't impact the downtown too much because, other than maybe a few tweaks that they'll be um, suggesting to the code itself. But this has the possibility of making some larger impacts on the surrounding communities, <coughs> on the surrounding neighborhoods as to what they'll look like and what process they'll go through because um, it'll continue with the transects. It'll really encourage um, uh, some transit development where you might get additional density at transit stops and, and put the densities there instead of having it spread out in a more suburban fashion. Uh, the other thing is we are um, at the tail end of a 10-year effort to update our flood maps. And with that, we've got 2,500 um, houses and properties being moved into a high-risk category. Um, there's a few that are coming out, so we are expecting that to be adopted this fall. And what that means, though, is that because there's additional um, building and uh, code restrictions, it will affect what buildings will look like. 
how buildings interact with the street because you're going to have to either have flood panels or it'll have to be elevated. So that does increase, just, it just changes what, what maybe the complexion of what the buildings will look like because it's not going to be as low to the ground perhaps as what they were. I just wanted to point that out as well in case people have need flood insurance. Get it now. Uh, <laughs> you want to already have flood insurance. It's much cheaper that way. The other thing that's changing and that can impact our future development is there's been a lot of increases in impact fees. Um, the city and water and sewer fees were put on hold about five years ago because um, we just didn't have any development and it was thought as a way to help spur development if we took that large um, uh, obligation off of them. But it's starting back up April 4th and then Sarasota County educational impact fee will start once again in May. That also was put on the back burner because as, you, as I mentioned before, we were losing population and the county as a whole was losing population. So they didn't need money for schools because we were losing kids. They were moving elsewhere to try and find jobs. In addition, Sarasota County is now proposing an impact fee increase. It's not on the books yet, but it is proposed that will increase. And then the city mobility fees which was formerly the um, road impact fees. And we switched last year to mobility fees simply because under a mobility fee, we can use that money for more interesting um, improvements. Road impact fees was, you have a problem, widen the road. Well, that doesn't necessarily fix all problems. So with the mobility fee, we can actually use that money and pay for widened sidewalks or more sidewalks. We can pay for uh, boat taxis and the infrastructure that's needed for water taxis. That would be cool to be able to go from Marina Jacks out to St. Armand's to go, you know, shopping or go for dinner or something. So the mobility fees are, are a way to be able to do that instead of simply widening roads. Um, and those are potentially going to increase as well. And what all that means is for a new single family home between 1,500 and 3,500 square feet, and this is a brand new one, not one that was a tear down and rebuild, because you, if you're tearing down, you get credit. This is for a brand new structure that needs to bring in new infrastructure, new utilities to it. As you can see, it's gonna increase substantially what that does. And that can unfortunately have potential impacts on affordable housing because of the large number um, that goes with it. So that can as well slow down maybe some of the development that's been occurring and to be honest I think that's part of the intent of some of the Commission is to try and slow down this rapid growth that we're, we're finding and because our codes are already in place that already allow a certain maximum amount of development this is one way that can help slow it down. <coughs> this is for multifamily and I just grabbed a number which was 100 units because when you get to like the city utility um, it's a very large number because it's based on the size the inch of the pipe that comes so you know it goes up so in this case the city this was I think a three inch line that comes in was that price you get up to a four inch line and it can get up to like hundred and fifty thousand dollars but that's per unit additional above and beyond the cost of construction, the cost of land, any permitting and all the other things that go with it. So while we have this rapid growth right now, in the future there's gonna be some additional fees that are out there that are gonna perhaps temper some of that uh, development that's going on. And one of the things I was asked about was if you're interested in projects that are going on that may otherwise not get site plan approval or be um, really out there, there are ways that you from home can find how to find these properties or the projects. So you can look at the plans without having to come down to the office. So this is a, a screenshot of the sarasotagov.com, our website. If you go down to the bottom to city services, there's, um, I highlighted in red, public records access. And with that, you can click on it. And unfortunately, it wouldn't let me take screenshots of the rest of the pages. But once you click on that, you can go to find and then click land development applications and put in an address that you're looking for. And you can search all of the old 
um, applications that have ever come in. You can look for all projects that have been submitted to the Development Review Committee or site plan approvals, and they are now scanning every application that comes into the city. So you can look at them all and be able to see what's you know maybe going on near your home, um, you know your, wherever you're you're at, and uh, be able to take a look at it. That's also the um, a link to it. Um, they are trying to get all the old ones updated. Not all of them are in there yet, just yet. Sometimes <clears> if you ask, they'll upload it. Maybe they've been scanned, but they're not online. But just wanted to give you that additional bit of information for you. And there's also, you can find building permits online. There's a lot of information that you can get there. Um, there's also another way, if you're interested in projects and other board activities, you can go on there and um, sign up for access to um, board reports, agendas, anything that you're interested in, and they'll send you um, reports for all of that, so, so you can stay engaged with whatever's happening. 